in my opinion, there's no serious evidence that there was any split in the Sangha at that early date. Okay? Um, according to all of the accounts of the Second Council, which are recorded in the canonical Vinayas, the Sangha had a dispute about different questions of Vinaya and that the dispute was settled. Okay? Every canonical account says the same thing. Okay? And I don't see any reason to doubt that. Now, there are various accounts of how the schism or the split between the Sangha, original split, came about. One of the problems with all of those accounts is that the, those accounts all date from much later than the events that they're talking about. 500 years, even a thousand years after the events that they're talking about, then they're describing uh, what's, what's happening. And if you look at those accounts in detail, what they seem to be doing is not really talking about the history of the first schism, which, happened, which supposedly happened before Ashoka. What they seem to be talking about is events at their own time. Okay? So they're talking about events and problems in their own day, and then they're backdating them to the time of the early schism. Okay, so I'll just give one example of, of what I mean by that. In the Theravadan account, in the Deepavangsa, as I mentioned, it says that the first schism happened immediately after the Second Council. And it's very surprising when you look, when you actually, actually read what it says the schism was about, because the Second Council was about these disputes about Vinaya, okay? And so you kind of expect that then the schismatic event, which happened immediately afterwards, should also be about events of Vinaya. That was what was on their mind. But actually, if you look at what it says, it doesn't say anything about Vinaya causing the schism. What caused the schism was arguments about textual redaction. Which is very curious, isn't it? That they argued about grammar. Also, how could the different schools of Buddhism be arguing about dialect when they're all living in the same region of India? Yeah, they're all living in the central Ganges plain, and they would have all spoken a Magadan dialect, you know, with maybe slight variations, but with hardly any variations. So how could they have been arguing about dialect at that point in Buddhist history? Surely it's much more reasonable that after Buddhism had spread across the whole of India and was in, in different areas, that then they would redact the canon in the local dialect of the area, as the Buddha said, and that at that point there might be disputes and arguments about matters of grammar or language or dialect and so on. Uh, so what we do know is that the Theravadan school of Sri Lanka, the, the, the school which which actually, rather than using the word Theravada, it's much more convenient to use the word Mahavihara or Mahaviharavasana, the dwellers in the great monastery. So the school we know today as Theravada, in fact, is the lineage of the Mahavihara in Sri Lanka. Okay? And there were uh, up to three main lineages, main monasteries in Sri Lanka. The Mahavihara was not the biggest one. And even if you look at the archaeological remains, the, the, the Jetavana uh, stupa, is by far the biggest, and the Abhayagiri is the second biggest, and the Mahavihara is the third biggest. But that's the one which uh, prevailed in the long term. <coughs> okay? So the Mahavihara is the textual tradition, the, what we call Theravada stems from the textual and commentarial tradition of the Mahavihara. Now, what we do know is that Mahavihara was arguing extensively with the Mahasangika communities of Andhra. Okay? Now, Andhra, these days, Andhra Pradesh, is the main, one of the main ports where they would have access to Sri Lanka. And the Mahavihara had a branch monastery there. We know that they had a, their own monastery there. We know that Mahasangika monasteries were there. They called the Aparasela and Pubasela branches of the Mahasangika. And in the, in the Mahavihara's controversial literature, especially the Katawattu and its commentary, the, the Mahavihara monks are constantly arguing with these Mahasangikas about different points of Abhidhamma and interpretation and so on and so forth. And so we know that this dispute, this argument was going on, it was going on in precisely that period when the account of the first schism was compiled. So that period was, we call it the middle period, say between 500 and 1,000 years after the Buddha passed away. Okay? So the early centuries of the common era. <clears throat> and during that period, the Mahavihara was arguing with the Sangika, <coughs> And in that period, the deeper ones of account was compiled, which projected that argument back before the early, middle period into the early period in the time just after the Second Council. Okay? So this is one example 
of the ways in which the schools constructed their own mythic identity. Okay? They wanted to say, we have the authority, we, our school is right, okay? and we can base that not only on the arguments and uh, rational debates that we can have about these points of Dhamma and so on, but we can also base that on this mythology which presents our school as being the central school, the earliest school, the purest school, etc, etc, etc. So, uh, when we sift through all of this evidence and all of these different approaches and texts from different um, uh, perspectives, then it seems to me that there's no serious evidence to suggest that there was any kind of split in Buddhism before the time of Ashoka. Okay? When we look at the Ashokan uh, inscriptions uh, uh, and edicts, there's no mention of any schools of Buddhism in any of the Ashokan edicts. There's no mention of any uh, schismatic processes having occurred. What they have, 